Namaste. Welcome and all blessings as you enter this new year. Uh, for many, uh, the new year begins with a kind of sense of resolution, kind of reviewing the past, looking into the future, the, sensing the landscape of life, and people recommit to whatever they think might bring increased health or happiness. Um, sometimes it has to do with daily habits of food or sleep or self-care, sometimes of caring for others. Some people choose a single word like love or beauty or gratitude, uh, just a filter to keep remembering. And often on the spiritual path, it's an opportunity really to deepen dedication to awakening the heart and the mind. I love the way the Zen masters put it, that the most important thing is remembering the most important thing. So I hope this reflection serves you in that way. Namaste and welcome. And always a welcome to those that are with us uh, on live stream. I feel like we're here with the world. And we begin tonight with a story that comes from a long time ago before any of us was born. Good king who wanted to ensure that there was an heir to his kingdom. He didn't have any children, he was growing old. But being a democratic sort, a kind of egalitarian guy, instead of just choosing someone, he decided he'd invite anybody that was interested in the job to come to the uh, kingdom. And in order to really make it equal, he, before they were to come up and be interviewed for the job, he provided this amazing uh, room where there was wardrobes and all sorts of goods. They could all just be wearing whatever they felt like they wanted to wear. Nobody was going to be shown up as less than someone else. So they could appear as their best. So the great day arrives and huge stream of people come streaming through the gates, excited by the idea of being king or queen. And uh, the king and his minister were waiting patiently in the upper chambers as the people first enjoyed the bathhouses and put on special perfumes if they chose, and the dress and the jewelry. And of course, they were, it was, they were graciously supplied all the foods that they might like. And so they kind of, all the people were milling around, kind of flirting and admiring themselves and each other and criticizing because, and again, the king didn't want them to go hungry, so they were, they were also enjoying the food and some puzzles and games and so on. And hours went by, and the king and the minister wondered why nobody was coming up, but they could hear the sounds of people having fun and fighting and playing and the whole deal. So finally, it got quiet. And the king sent the minister down to see what was going on. And it, he reported, as when he came up sadly, that everyone had left. And they took with them the remainder of the food and the jewelry and the clothing. They were full, they were tired, and they forgot why they came. <laughs> so that's the story. <laughs> and it's really a story of all of us forgetting why we're here. Each day, really, probably each hour. I sometimes use the language of the big squeeze that we live in, uh, where we go into trance all the time and then there's a some part of us that knows it and knows that the who we are and the mystery of being here and the depth of spirit in each of us is shining through, but it's every day we forget. You know, every day we move through carried by what we might call habit energy. We all have it. I mean, every one of us. And to different degrees, we're in some way trying to control our way through the day and um, trying to get others' approval or to get gratification of getting things done or getting making money or whatever it is in terms of meeting other people's expectations or um, protecting ourselves against making mistakes, um, in some way manipulating behaviors so we basically get what we want. I was thinking about this habit energy and 
came across this uh, cartoon of a man's walking in a city street and he's eating a bag of chips and he's walking by this ledge and the pigeon is standing on the ledge and the pigeon says to him, nice jacket. Second frame, the guy says, thank you. Next frame, uh, pigeon says, be a shame if something were to happen to it. <laughs> Last frame, the pigeon says, leave the chips. <laughs> Manipulation on all levels. So the big squeeze, we forget why we're here, and then deep down there's this intuition of uh, this love and presence and awareness that is waking up through us and that we're here to experience its full manifestation. Um, In the forgetting, there's suffering. It's, Thoreau said, we go through life fishing only to realize it wasn't fish we were after. So from the Zen tradition, one of the great all-time elegant ways of framing this is that the most important thing is remembering the most important thing. Okay? And that's going to be really the theme of of this reflection we'll be doing together. The Buddha put it that this whole world lives on the tip of intention. That your intention in any given moment, like right now, creates your experience. So how aware are we of our intention? And um, For instance, right now, if I had to say my intention, it's to be awake in this heart right now, so that whatever is expressed as part of, that we can wake up together, that I can wake up and we can wake up, so that we can experience that love and awareness. And that's my intention. It's it's to be really sincere, to not... um, not to give a talk in some sort of habitual way where I know the ideas and they're packaged, but to be inhabiting it. That, and I'm taking my time speaking even that right now because the more we pay attention to our intention, the more it comes above the line, and for those of you that aren't familiar with that, that means just imagine a circle and a line that's going through it, and what's below the line is outside of awareness. What's above the line is in our awareness, and the line moves the more we practice presence. So by becoming conscious of our intention, we actually can inhabit it more, live from it. Does that make sense? This is what we're going to explore, how to bring intention above the line, how to see when we're coming from an intention that's fear-based, which is totally natural, but to, if we can bring it above the line, then we have choice. So, each moment, our intention is either, I want more of this, or I'm afraid of that, or it might be that as we're waking up more, that our intention is towards connection, or towards spiritual realization. It could be any of those levels of our being. And in any moment, if we can see what's running our intention, then we can drop into a more pure expression. So to give a taste, we'll just start right in right now with the reflection. Um, And that's an invitation, if you'd like, to kind of go inside and check this out. So if you will, bring up something that's coming up in your life that you're anxious about. And when I say anxious, I don't mean terrified and panic attack kind of anxious. I mean anxious, like maybe it's something that, a deadline that you've got, or a talk that you have to have with somebody, or um, something, something that you're doing that others are going to be evaluating in some way. It may be something that happens all the time, just something that you're anxious about that's every day at work when you have to be with a certain person or do a certain type of activity. Mm 
Maybe you're anxious about something going on with your health. Maybe you're anxious about what's going on for another person that you care about. So come up with something. As you do, begin to investigate and sense the part of you that's anxious, we'll call it the anxious part, that has some intention to to manage things or to try to have things come out okay, to protect yourself. It's a part of you that generates obsessive thoughts, part of you that tenses up physically. And as you get in touch with that part, just sense your experience of yourself, the who you are. Notice how familiar it is. Notice if you like this self. Notice how this self is in relation to other people, whether you feel more separate. This is when the self is, when the intention is to control out of anxiety. Now, take a few breaths. Keeping in mind what you're anxious about, sense how there's a part of you that really wants to learn how to wake up in the midst of the challenges and stressors of life. There's a part of you that, you know, that that notion of no mud, no lotus, that really wants to sense the lotus in you, the resources in you waking up, so that even when there's stressful situations, you have more equanimity, more balance, the part of you that really wants to find more freedom. Just to get in touch with you, with with the part that has that intention or aspiration to find more peace and freedom in the midst of difficulty. And as you do, and you feel that sincerely, notice the sense of your being now. Who are you when that's the intention? Rather than managing what you're anxious about, your intention is to wake up and find, find a sense of balance in the midst, to be bigger, to be more spacious. And notice the difference of who you are when you're driven by the fear-based intention versus the intention for waking up. You can keep that in mind. If you'd like to keep your eyes closed and keep reflecting as I speak, it's fine, or you can open them. Typically, for most of us, our intentions are marbled. And what I mean by that is, when we're anxious, there's parts of us that are obsessing and worrying and trying to controlling, but there's a part of us also that has the intention to see if we can find some space in the midst of it and be more awake. They're just mixed like that, which is really natural. For instance, love and attachment are mixed. You might totally love your child, and also being attached to your child, being a certain way and performing a certain way and cooperating with you. And both energies are there. And when you're really in that love energy, you can feel you get more spacious. And when you're really the controlling whatever parent, you get smaller. And they're mixed, even at sometimes right around the same time. And the same thing with loving a partner and being attached to a partner. You might have a real deep appreciation for someone, but also get possessive or controlling or jealous or demanding, wanting to be treated in a certain way. So we have mixed intentions. And you can sense it in the ways that we get 
uh, habitual in relating to others that sometimes we're driven by the intention to kind of inflate ourselves, and we might gossip or speak poorly about somebody, kind of putting them down and feeling a little bit of smugness or satisfaction in teaming up with somebody and putting that down somebody else. And, you know, it comes from insecurity and it's, it's not a very skillful way to bond with people and by putting down others, but we, that can happen and that's one level of intention. Or then there's a part of us that sometimes really speaks well of others and appreciates them and, that, and there's just a sense of inherent respect and that's coming from a very deep and different part of us. This marbling is totally conditioned by our culture. I mean, it's not our conditioning, it's our culture's conditioning. And you can sense it. And then we're given all these mixed messages by our culture. Now, a very dramatic example, one guy, Butch Hancock, describes the messages, the religious messages that came from his hometown in the backwoods, so to speak. He says, life in Lubbock, my small hometown, taught me two things. One is that God loves you and you're going to burn in hell. (laughs) And the other is that sex is the most awful, filthy thing on earth and you should save it for someone you love. (laughs) So you get the idea, mixed messages here. So each of us has our particular blend of wants and fears that are driving us and then the more awakened intentions of wanting to live from caring and live, and live to truth and, and speak from truth. And so we get caught in some habitual patterns and we sense our potential to live from our deepest, highest aspiration. The challenge is, again, they're below the line a lot. So it takes being intentional about looking at intention. This is D.H. Lawrence. He says, we're not free when we're doing just what we want. We're only free when we're doing what the deepest self likes. And to do what the deepest self likes takes some diving. Okay, so how do we dive? In the Buddhist tradition, the attention to aspiration or intention, really meditating on it, is actually very central to the practice. And so we're going to explore ways of of diving. And the, the beginning is to sense how it is we become very attached to certain intentions that don't work out so well for us. And I think one of the best kind of descriptions that we hear is this, that the thought manifests as the word, the word manifests as the deed. The deed develops into habit, habit hardens into character, character gives birth to destiny. So watch your thoughts and intention with care. Let them spring from love, born out of respect for all beings, including yourself. So it begins, we can sense that the thoughts and beliefs that are, under, that are under the line are really generating our habits and our activities. And if we're not aware of them, if we don't pause and start sensing, okay, well, what's my intention right now? We keep playing out the same pattern. It becomes destiny. It was described in an illustration with three construction workers. They're standing in a row next to next to traffic and they're carrying signs, each of them has signs. The first one sign says, uh, first one has this big sign that says stop. The second one carries a sign that says smell the flowers. And and this woman's carrying some flowers in her hand. And the third carries a sign that says, okay, resume tearing through your life like a maniac. (laughs) And we can see it, that we get these reminders all the time to slow down. It's not like racing around really helps us achieve more. And it certainly doesn't do anything for having intimacy. I find over and over again, I especially see this on retreat, that when I move half as fast, I take in twice as much. We don't have to rush so much. 
And yet there's some deep intention in us that's fear-based to get more done. So we speed around a lot. Not all of us. Some people are, are, are much slower than others. So maybe I'm speaking for myself here. <laughs> but there's a tendency in the culture, it's part of the culture's conditioning, to speed. So let's look a little more closely how to bring uh, intention above the line and live more aligned. And um, there's a story, and go back in time a little bit, um, I was teaching at a conference, and this was uh, 2001, I think it was, um, and the conference was, there were five opening presenters, I was one of them, it was run by Tricycle, and um, it was actually held in the Twin Towers uh, three weeks before 9-11, which is why I share the story a lot, because it's kind of a poignant memory for me. I took one of the pens from the building that actually had the address and so on. So I was one of five opening presenters, and I was uh, the only woman, and I was a real newbie, and this was a while ago. And we were each given ten minutes, and I was very nervous about it, because I was um, going after a very well-known guy, Richard Baker Roshi, who's a Dharma heir to Suzuki Roshi, and so I was really nervous. But I was really relieved because um, I was going second, he was going first, so I knew I'd have some time to prepare my thoughts and to breathe and so on. So Richard Baker Roshi gets up, and the question that we're all supposed to address is, um, you know, really, what allows people to heal and awaken and touch genuine freedom? Just that, you know, <laughs> 10 minutes, <laughs> piece of cake, you know. So I'm, you know, I have this, start thinking of my stories and little poems and quotes, and I'm thinking about all I'm going to do. Okay, so he gets up there to speak, and he says, transformation and awakening comes down to two things, intention and attention. Thank you very much. And he's down, and I'm sitting there, oh my God, I'm on, you know. And I wish I'd had the wits to say, like he said, you know, if only, but I didn't. I don't have any idea what I said, but I do remember what he said. Intention and attention, and they go together. The more you become aware of your intention, like the intention to care, the more that brings up attention, like you start paying attention more, which then brings out the caring, and that deepens your intention. And they, and they just feed each other in a really beautiful way. So it's not just about, let's say, my intentions to care. It's not just about the intention. You have to pay attention in order to manifest it. And if you're not, if you're just saying, well, I'm intending this and I'm intending that, but you're kind of blithely going along, um, what happens is you don't manifest. Intention and attention. You have to pay attention. Here's, a, a, I think, a great illustration. Uh, a guy who's a bagpiper wrote this. He says, I play many gigs. Recently I was asked by a funeral director to play at a graveside service for a homeless man. He had no friends or family, so the service was to be at a pauper cemetery in the back country. Now, I wasn't familiar with the backwoods. I got lost, and being a typical man, I didn't stop for directions. I finally arrived an hour late and saw the funeral guy had evidently gone and the hearse was nowhere in sight. There were only diggers and the crew left and they were eating lunch. I felt badly and I apologized to the men for being late. I went to the side of the grave and looked down and the vault lid was already in place. I didn't know what else to do, so I started to play. The workers put down their lunches and began to gather around. I played out my heart and soul for this man with no family and friends. I played like I've never played there before for this homeless man. And as I played Amazing Grace, the workers began to weep. They wept, and I wept, and we all wept together. And when I was finished, I packed up my bagpipes and started for my car. Though my head hung low, my heart was full. As I opened the door to my car, I heard one of the workers say, I've never seen nothing like that before, and I've been putting in septic tanks for 20 years. (laughs) 
so intention and attention. <laughs> point of the story here. So I'd like to now give you an illustration of how when we bring both, when you start setting your intention and paying attention, how they actually allow your heart and spirit to manifest. And this is a story of a woman, uh, this is some years back, she told me how she had been in a, in a standoff for decades with her older sister, and she was the impulsive and non-traditional type, and uh, the kind of the bad girl when they were younger, and her older sister was always dutiful and getting the grades and doing things according to, uh, you know, schedule. Well, they just uh, kind of parted ways. She always felt misunderstood and not appreciated. And the more dis- they got more and more distant and tense to the point that she wasn't even invited to one niece's wedding after they had a particularly bitter argument. But now their dad had died, and their mom was sick, and they were forced together for the holidays. So this is where things begin. They are at Thanksgiving together, and she's all ready for difficulty. There's a disagreement about the, their mother's diet, you know, how they... She, she's suggesting gluten-free and holistic and this and that, and her, you know, naturally plant-based, and her older sister's saying, well, everything's got to fit your philosophy, and left the room, you know, and, and she, she, so she just was all hurt and angry and uh, left the room and thinking she really dislikes me, what's wrong with me? And, you know, so many times she had asked, I you know, can't make her like me, she doesn't understand me, she doesn't care. So she brought some compassion inward, which is always when we get um, stuck, the first place is to pay attention and offer caring within. And once she had done that, she could say, okay, What's the intention that's driving me? What's under the line? And the under the line intention was she was trying to get respect, trying to get her sister's appreciation, trying to be seen. So it was from this young place in her. So she continued to offer self-compassion to that because that's completely understandable. It just wasn't getting her what she wanted. So she offered self-compassion and said, what's my deepest intention? Okay, so first she saw the intention that was more the ego intention, brought compassion. What's my deepest intention? And her deepest intention was loving connection. Loving connection. So that became her prayer. You know, that deep intention was her prayer, loving connection. For the rest of the evening she was paying more attention. And she didn't need so much to insert her opinion or defend or whatever. A month later, they were back together for the holidays again. And there was more ease, and they laughed together over some old family stories. And later that night, her sister told her uh, about a tough time with her teenage son, and something shifted. In fact, at the end, her sister said, you know, thank you for listening, for being such a good shoulder. And she realized that this intention for connection, it's like, do you want to be right or do you want to have connection kind of thing, um, really gave more space. It just made it, it just relieved the tension with her sister. And she deepened her, you know, that deepened her intention to, to stay with that. In fact, her language was, not my will, but my heart's will. You know, not my ego's will, which wants to be right, wants to be seen, wants to be appreciated, but my heart's will, which is really a willingness to connect and to be close and to be caring. Whatever your intention is, that gets communicated. So if it's marbled, that gets communicated, and people are used to that. But as it gets purer, and your intention is, I really do care about you, that comes across. We communicate our intention. So, again, the sequence or the path is to start right where we are. It's not like all trying to kind of push ourselves into some noble intention, just start right where we are. Oh, right this moment, I want to look good, or I want to make an impression, or 
you know, whatever it is. And of course, if you're in action, then it doesn't go to, you can't do is examine it with the same depth. But let's say you're noticing it and you have some time to be with yourself. Oh, I want to make an impression. And then you say, okay, well, that's natural and you're kind towards it. Now, what do I really want? I want to feel close. I want to feel connected. I want to feel that loving presence. And the deeper we go, the more we start living from who we truly are, from the most pure and clean and awake expression of our own being. So we're going to practice a little bit of this and as as we have in the past, take a moment to find a way of sitting and close your eyes, it feels comfortable. in the quietness, invite yourself right here. The more you start with presence, the more clarity and scanning your life and checking in. So feel your body here, feel your body breathing. Inhabit your body with presence. And from this presence, Scan your life right now and see if there's a place of conflict or distance with someone you care about that you'd like to, where you'd like to feel closer. Some place of tension. It could be a person at work, a person at home, family where there's tension, where there's disagreement, where there's some repeating pattern, perhaps, that um, creates distance. And as you identify the person and bring to mind a particular situation that illustrates where the distance is and what's happening. Just bring in that situation closer in so you can sense yourself in it and what's going on when you're feeling defensive about something or judged or whether you're feeling judging, let down, dis- disappointed, misunderstood, whatever it is. But let yourself go right into the situation. You might even see the person's face and what they're saying and what it's triggering in you. Notice how you're behaving and behind that, notice what your intention is. Is your intention to get them to be different? Is your intention to be understood, to get their respect, to in some way win their attention or love? Is it to protect yourself from demands? Is it to push them away in some way? What's your intention? And sense your whole sense of yourself when that intention is ruling your experience. The intention to protect yourself or assert yourself, get something, defend something, be right, have your way. Just sense the experience of your own being. And if you like yourself, Because part of what's under the line is that often when we're being driven by a fear-based intention, we don't like ourselves really. So bring that above the line too, that there's some self-aversion sometimes when we're caught in an ego intent. And then just taking some moments to sense this, the naturalness of this, that, okay, there's something hurting. There's unmet needs, 
there's something that you're really wanting or fearing, and bring some compassion to that. The idea is not to punish the ego intent, but to really bring kindness to the needs that are there. You will not find your way to a more pure or deeper intention until you bring compassion to what's here. You might even put your hand on your heart and just offer, really, kindness to whatever needs are in you when you're in this conflict. Just feel that you're offering a real sense of warmth and care. And then from that place of presence and kindness, listen deeply, what is your most pure intention here now? What would be your deepest intention with this person? What do you really want to happen? And when you sense your deepest intention, what new choices might come up and how to respond to this person? Sense who you are, the sense of your own being, when you're connected with your deepest intention. Can you sense how when your intention is deep and pure, you're actually touching the very essence of your true nature, your highest self, what I sometimes call our future self. It's who you're really evolving into, manifesting, the bodhisattva within. On this path of awakening, intention and attention, we pay attention, we notice the intentions that might be more fear-based, we bring a kind attention, we go deeper, we notice the deepest intention, where attention flows, energy goes. You can open your eyes if you'd like. So thus far, tonight, in exploring, really, um, manifesting intention, and our purest intention, the first major place we looked at has been, how do we open up our intention and deepen it when we're caught in a kind of an egoic place? How do we move from an ego intention to a more spiritual intention? I want to just touch on that when we're not in the grip, we can also just reflect and ask, well, what is my deepest intention in any given moment? And again, it's part of the bodhisattva path, this path of awakening, that we keep checking and sense, what's my intention right now? Is my intention presence? You know, is my intention to be open-hearted? People often ask me, well, how do I know? You know, it's like I'll, every week here, at the beginning of the practice say, okay, what's your intention for being here? And I've often had people after class in the line, you know, say, well, you asked that, and I have no idea what my intention is, you know. So first of all, it takes a certain amount of presence to notice your intention. So what you might do is after the meditation, after you've settled some, then say, what is my intention? But there are three signs of a liberating intention intention. Three signs. And, and these, this has really helped me to use this as kind of a, a guide when I'm just paying attention to my own experience. And um, so I want to name them for you. And the first is a liberating intention always has to do with manifesting your innate potential. You know, it's not like um, 
for one person that just doesn't have any musical talent at all to say, well, my, my deepest intention is to be able to play in the National Orchestra cello. You know, it's, it's like it's not that. It's really manifesting what's inherent in our being to love fully, to live creatively, to be able to serve, to realize truth. Okay, so it's really going for a manifesting who we are. And uh, Lily Tomlin says, even if you win a rat race, you're still a rat. <laughs> so, and by the way, I, the only reason I don't like that is because I actually think rats are just a great creature as a, a mouse or a hamster or a gerbil or any of them. <laughs> but it's still, you get the idea, the rat race in the wheel. Okay, so that's the first one, that it has to do with manifesting. Um, some people will think, oh, my intention, I'm going to hike the Appalachian Trail, you know, and or I'm going to get, I want to, you know, like create an app for instant enlightenment, you know, or have my partner use that app, <laughs> or whatever it is. So, again, there's all sorts of intentions you can have, but it has to do with manifesting who you are, your love, your capacity for truth your capacity to serve. Okay, that's the first one. So the second one is that for an intention or aspiration to be pure, it has to be embodied. If I say my intention is to be, a, is to be loving without holding back, but it's just this idea, this abstraction, it's not a pure intention. It has to be like really sincere and in my body and feeling it to really have that aliveness. Uh, Let me, this is uh, Oprah Winfrey, she says, ask yourself, what is my truest intention? Give yourself time to let a yes resound within you. When it's right, I guarantee that your entire body will feel it. For a number of years, I kept toggling in my deep intention between this intention for love and I'd feel it and I'd go, yeah, that's it. I just really want to love and be loved. I want to, I just want to be loving presence itself. That, that's it. And then I'd be at another retreat and my intention would be truth. I just want to know truth. That's it. And it would be like really in my body, like, wow, I just, reality, I am reality, I just want to know and be reality, and that was it. And I kept thinking, God, I wish I knew which one, you know. <laughs> and then I realized that they're both it, you know, it's because, and in a way, they're different sides of the same coin. But the point is, your experience of your true aspiration, it's not like you have to have one that's, this is it for the rest of my life. It's going to have different flavors and expressions over time. All that matters is it expresses the who you are becoming or expresses your true nature in some way, manifest, and that you're inhabiting and feeling it in a very um, embodied way. That's the second part, but let me now tell you Part number three, which is that your true aspiration always relates to this moment. So it's not like um, St. Augustine who says, Lord, grant me chastity and continence, but not yet. (laughs) You got the idea. It's not like down the road. It's that... It's what your spiritual life aspires to right in this moment, which again requires presence. Like, what matters in this moment? Well, in this moment it matters to really be here, like awake, tender, really present. So these are the three. And why we repeatedly want to contact our aspiration Because the more you contact it, the more you're in touch with your aspiration, the more you're actually going to pay attention in a way that will um, deepen it. I remember at my first Buddhist retreat, and this was about 30-some years ago, 
a um, few days in, I really got settled and quiet. And I guess I had been really busy because I kept thinking, wow, you know, this is spacious and peaceful. And then it, it got, the stillness was so profound that my heart just, it just opened and just filled this vast space. And then I burst out crying. And, and there was a part of me witnessing it all going, oh, why am I crying? But it was just this, but not really, because I knew, you know, that happy sad of um, the joy of homecoming and also this cherishing and the sense of, oh, I long for this, I want to, I want this in my life. And, and that, that was a real moment of, uh, I guess Rilke calls it the winds of homecoming, that was a moment of pure aspiration. I really long to live from this kind of open-hearted presence. And I realized that that touching that brought, deepened my attention in a way that allowed me to keep on living from more open-hearted, in, open-hearted presence. And that every time I got in touch with that longing, it deepened my attention. So it, it became a practice after that, at the beginning of meditations or at the end or whatever, to get really quiet and sense, okay, right this moment, you know, what really in this moment is the aspiration for my spiritual life? And to feel it in my body. It needs to be practice. We started with the king and all the people that came and didn't stay and just a sense in our own lives that we know the ways each day we get lost in trance. I mean, every one of us knows it. And how much power and possibility there is if we just begin to on purpose say, okay, what matters? Before we enter a meeting, before we're with somebody where there's going to be a difficult conversation, right at the beginning of the day to set the day, like, what matters today? One of my, the prayers that I offer most regularly um, in the mornings after I meditate is, please teach me about kindness. Just please teach me, because there's something in me that just wants to keep learning about, like, oh, okay, this is a moment to pause to get softer, to respond differently. That if we have that prayer to care, then we begin to pay attention to others in a different way. We start noticing our impact on others. Like we actually, and this is a really powerful one, if, if your intention is to live from love, to stop before you send an email and imagine that the email is written to you and reread it. Because we're usually stuck in our mentality and we don't get our impact on others. And yet we're always impacting or inter impacting all the time. Intention, this is just a small example. Well, have you pause and reread that email? Because ultimately it's so much more important that you send out a ripple of of kindness, care, and understanding than something that will in any way create distance. So this is our inquiry. Do you know what's most important to you? Do you know right now what your intention is? And how can you remember it regularly? Okay, so let's, we're going to practice together, but I'd like to share with you uh, this from Mary Oliver, because closing your eyes, if you will. She writes, tell me, oh, first, before she writes this, let me just give you, set it up. In this poem, she's kneeling prayer-like in a field and contemplates with wonder a grasshopper who's gazing around with enormous, complicated eyes. Tell me, what else should I have done? Doesn't everything die at last and too soon? 
tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? We close just listening to our hearts with patience. It may not be this moment, it may be some later moment today or tomorrow. But then we listen again and again and again. What is it that we most deeply care about? If you just had a short time before you're going to die, what would you most care about? If you're at the end of your life looking back, what would matter about today, about how you live the rest of today? What is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? Namaste and thank you for your attention.